Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. My name is Rodrigo Ferreira. I'm an assistant teaching professor in computer science. And it is a pleasure to be here with you today and to also hear from some of the other excellent presentations that we've been seeing. For my presentation, I, I want to tackle a conceptual question. I, I want to pose an invitation for us to think about, well, we have been talking a lot throughout this conference about tech ethics, uh, maybe from different perspectives and using different frames. But in many ways, we've been talking about tech ethics. This has been an increasingly popular topic as well. And what I want to do is I want to invite us to think more thoroughly or with more detail about what is it that we mean when we talk about tech ethics. And um, hopefully, if you will allow, I'll also share some of the experiences that we have had here at Rice University precisely teaching tech ethics and what we are doing to further the causes that we care about around social justice and environmental justice as well. So maybe as a first step, uh, this term can be helpful. Uh, the Financial Times in 2018 uh, coined the term tech clash to refer to the growing distrust that they were sensing in the public view around technology and around technology corporations. Um, of course, since then, this phenomenon has grown around the world, and perhaps with good reason. Right? We, we all are familiar with some of the big scandals that have taken place around technology in the last few years, having to do with racist algorithms, having to do with social media use and addiction, also questions around privacy and around political influence. And well, these the scandals in many ways keep on coming, right? Because more recently we have heard about the collapse of the cryptocurrency exchange FTX. Um, there's also a lot of questions around Elon Musk's purchase of Twitter, right? And throughout this time, as these questions have emerged, well, at the same time, there have been other voices that said, well, we, we need to do something about this, right? We, we need to really encourage people, and maybe in particular students, to think about some of these issues. And well, the university might be the place for that, right? So since a few years ago, Kathy O'Neill, uh, the famous author of Weapons of Math Destruction, um, wrote an article in the New York Times talking about how the ivory tower can't keep ignoring tech, right? And calls have been made precisely to say, well, if we're going to confront this problem, it has to start in the classroom, right? Why? Because people are going afterwards to go and work in these big corporations, having this big impact on the world, right? So while they're students is that we need to address some of these issues. And to be fair, a lot has been done, right? Universities have responded to this call. Uh, for instance, the embedded ethics program that we see at Harvard, uh, there's also more and more academic conferences on some of these topics. For instance, the ACM conference on fairness, accountability, and transparency. And luckily, this has been not only in universities, but also corporations are more and more talking about the social good, right? And research centers are interested in public interest technology. And we see increasing conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion. But of course, even with consideration of those efforts, there are questions, right? Because, well, saying that you're going to teach something and then actually teaching it is, is a very different question, right? Particularly when there are these interdisciplinary efforts that have to be made between the humanities and computer science, for instance. How is it that we can best teach technology and ethics? There's also been questions around corporations, right, that do increasingly talk about ethics, but are they really practicing what they're saying, or um, are they engaging more in this concept that people have discussed in terms of ethics washing, right? Just like there's pink washing, just like there's green washing, just like there's rainbow washing, people are also concerned about ethics washing, right? That perhaps corporations are just engaging in these discursive practices for their own gain, right? For financial reasons, or perhaps to fend off regulators, right? Saying we're doing the ethical work ourselves. 
So the, the, the first question that I would like for us to think about in this regard is, well, if we are interested in some of these issues around ethics and technology, and I know a lot of us here, maybe not all of us, but a lot of us here are professors, are researchers, maybe student advisors, scholars, activists of some sort, right? What can we do to confront some of these issues? And I, I think that one very important thing to consider is that, well, yes, if, if we're talking to the students, right, we have to think more about how we can best reach out to the students, right? If we take seriously the notion that some of these problems can be addressed effectively at the university level, we have to think about the students and, well, as I'm sure you have encountered, these students are gonna go work in the corporations, they have their eyes set then on making big changes around the world, right? But at the same time, they're also very stressed out, right? And the students, uh, we know, perhaps from our own experience, are stressed, are suffering from anxiety, um, they're increasingly focused on exams and getting certain grades. Um, again, according to The Economist, they're more concerned about getting good, getting good grades than about drinking or unplanned pregnancies. COVID, of course, didn't help, right? So we see increased rates of mental health issues and anxiety among students. Also, the university has changed, right? Uh, th this may be a very kind of archaic model. Um, here's a painting, the School of Athens. But when, when Plato first conceived of the academy of the school, the idea was that, yes, it would be a place for learning and for conversation. But it was meant to be a place of leisure. It was meant to be a place that would allow students or would allow young, bright minds to temporarily exit from their vocational duties, right? Not necessarily having to do the same thing that their parents were doing, right? And have a space to, to breathe and, and, to, and to walk around and to think about some of the bigger questions and how to improve society, right? But uh, universities over time have changed, right? Um, nowadays, we see more of universities following certain business practices and certain business models. At the same time, we see that universities tend to be more reliant on contingent labor. So every time, less and less tenured faculty. And well, in many ways, what this adds up to is that, well, there's more incentives for professors who may be in precarious situations to try to give the students good grades so they get good course evaluations, right? So then there starts to be this inflation in grades all around. Students look around, everybody's getting A's, they feel like they need to get A's too, right? So it just makes for this further pressure for the students. We also need to think about, well, what are we talking about when we're talking about tech ethics, right? Because as I mentioned before, there, there's a lot of different terminology, right? So, you know, sometimes we talk about the social good, sometimes we talk about the public good or the public interest. Other times we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? Do these things all mean, do these concepts all mean the same thing? Do they mean something different? Do these differences matter? And also important is for us to think about, well, how are we talking about some of these concepts? Because even as we try to talk about ethics, well, ethics is not one thing, right? Even within Philosophical theory, there's different branches or, or different levels of analysis for ethics. There's normative ethics, there's applied ethics, more broadly there's meta-ethics, right? There's also the fact that historically in philosophy there have been this kind of intellectual divisions between certain kinds of doing philosophy, which are very popular here in the US for instance, and other kinds of philosophy, which um, some people refer to as continental philosophy, right? So what potential lessons could be learned from intellectual traditions such as existentialism and phenomenology and critical theory, for instance, that are not often a part of ethics curricula? At the same time, there's interdisciplinary efforts having to do with media studies, with SDS, with cultural studies, post-colonial theory, right? Are these a part of the ethics questions that we want to address? <clears throat> 
And then, of course, there's the big question around the relationship between ethics and politics. Right? Because some people believe that those are different things, right? And we need different classes for them. Um, you know, maybe you teach certain topics in politics, such as social contract theory, for instance, political economy, that doesn't much have to do with ethics, right? And even if you were to want to talk about politics, well, you know, a lot of questions emerge as to, well, what kind of politics are you talking about, right? And are we talking about activism? And if so, what kind of activism? So all in all, um, again, I want to invite us to think about the fact that, well, when, when we talk about tech ethics, what are we talking about and how are we talking about it? Those are the two questions that I will go into in further detail for the, the remainder of my presentation. So starting with the first one, what, what are we talking about? When we talk about tech ethics, what are we talking about? Right? And I mentioned a few examples here. Sometimes we're talking about the social good, sometimes about the public interest, sometimes about DEI. So in regards to the first one, right, I, I like to think about this as a constellation of concepts, the social constellation. Right? Google, for instance, says, well, we want to develop tech responsibly. Right? We want to solve humanitarian and environmental challenges. And of course, it's not only Google, right? but you find other concepts in public discourse talking about social responsibility, corporate social responsibility. Sometimes you hear people talk about human-centered design. Right? And maybe as we first hear about these concepts, you think about the social good, right? And well, you think, of course, about the people, and you think about the environment, right? And this says, well, you know, this nails it. This is what we're talking about when we're talking about ethics, right? However, I prompt us to think, right? Is there really one thing as the social? Is there really one thing as the human, right? Because when we talk about society, inevitably, inevitably, we have to think about social classes. And we need to think about the fact that there are different viewpoints and that from these viewpoints, different histories, right? There have always been these divisions between the haves and the have-nots, maybe in more technical terms, between the owners of the means of production and the workers, right? And as we think about this, it's important that we consider that, okay, let's do things for society, right? Let's do things for the environment. But who exactly are we talking about here? Because 10% of the world's population owns 76% of the wealth. They take in over 50% of income and account for 48% of global carbon emissions. So yes, save the planet, absolutely, right? But if we're thinking of the planet as just a set of resources there to be exploited, right? And there to be exploited by certain people in certain situations at the expense of others, well, that's not getting us very far. So again, I think, yes, let's, let's think about the social good, right? But we need to do this with further specificity, right? Considering a history of different socioeconomic viewpoints, circumstances, and inequalities. Okay, so, so, so maybe the social constellation only gets us thus far. Maybe we need to think about other terms, such as the public, right? We all care about the public, of course. And uh, here we have the Public Interest Technology Network talking about how, well, we want to do things in a way that generates public benefits and promotes the public good, right? And you, you hear this kind of conceptual conversations taking place in philanthropy, also in popular media, in universities. And of course, if you think about the public interest, well, you're thinking about the people, right? You're, you're thinking about developing technologies that people can use to communicate more effectively, to work together more effectively, to establish relationships more effectively. Right? But also we have to consider that, well, what is it that we are conceptualizing the public and opposed to? Right? Is it supposed to be the public versus the private? Right? Because it seems like there's very good reason for us to be concerned about well, some of these efforts that perhaps for individual or for corporate reasons are more concerned with perhaps profit motives than, again, for the public good. And if we think about these lines, if we think about this dichotomy, it again starts be, to become problematic, right? Because if, if we look at the history of the public sphere, um, and this is from the work of Jürgen Habermas, 
we know that the public sphere emerged following the Enlightenment, for, uh, following the French Revolution, where, yes, it was getting rid of kings and priests, right, for the good of the people, but the people was referring to actually a very select group of people, right? It was referring to the commercial interests of the bourgeois class, right? So in many ways, the birth of the public sphere starts precisely with bourgeois commercial interests. And it wasn't that long ago, precisely, that we were talking about the political potential of some of these networks, right? That we now look at some of these private social media corporations. Just a few years ago, we were thinking about how it was that they were liberating us from this kind of centralized authoritarian sources of control, right? And again, whether we like it or not, people engage through these social networks to look at the news, right? To inform themselves about the public sphere and to participate in public discourse. So in my mind, when we talk about the public and perhaps put it in opposition to the private, I think it's more important that we think about how we can align or perhaps even realign these two different concepts, right? And how it is that we can use them to think about, well, the issues that arise when it comes to different publics. Um, people also talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion a lot, right? And I think that this is, this is a very, very important conversation that we need to have. Right, so for instance, uh, consulting agencies such as Deloitte say, well, it's important that companies work to cultivate DEI. And well, there, there's also other terms that emerge alongside it. Sometimes people talk about diversity and inclusion. Sometimes they talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, right? They think about different efforts that can be done precisely to support some of these efforts. And again, when we think about these questions here, I mean, obviously everyone will agree on that equality is of the utmost importance, right? We look at the reality of the world and we look at this massive inequalities that exist, right? And we say we want to do something about it, all right? We want to look for equality. Lately, people have been talking more about equity, right? And equity poses this, this perhaps more radical challenge, right? Because it says, well, perhaps equality is not enough, right? Perhaps, uh, as Dr. Bird was precisely mentioning, we need to look at these histories, right? These histories matter. And we need to understand that not all people um, need the same kind of resources in order to reach the same levels, right? So in that regard, maybe we need to think about equity. And sometimes these are put in opposition to each other. In my mind, these are two different strategies for working towards the same goal, right? Because yes, they are mutually incompatible at any given time, but it's important that we think about these differences. It's important that we think about these trade-offs because eventually what we want to get to is the removal of those barriers, right? Where equality and equity are not so much in a position to each other, but have synthesized in some way towards being able to achieve this greater notion of liberation, right? So, yeah, let's think about fairness, let's think about it with a subtlety, let's understand the conceptual incompatibilities that exist. But let's not forget that we're working towards a common goal, right? And let's think about those trade-offs and have the relevant conversations. So this is all to say that, well, when we talk about tech ethics, there's this plethora of different concepts that enter into these different dichotomies, right? But what is it that we ultimately care about? Uh, there has been a lot of work recently, precisely, on this question. Um, so, for instance, Kate Crawford, who um, gave a keynote speech a few months ago, precisely in anticipation of this conference, she talks about, well, you know, m maybe the discourse on ethics can only get us so far. Maybe it's time to talk about power. Right? And what does that mean? That, well, maybe it's time precisely that we focus not so much on this discursive conceptual rhetoric, right? But that we think about the people, and not always people, right? Because of the, the environment is of critical concern here as well, right? But let's, let's look at the people, let's look at the non-human entities behind this data. That is ultimately what we care about. And if we do that, perhaps we move away from this discourse, and this is from an excellent book called Data Feminism, by the way, 
Maybe we move away from some of these concepts that are, pro are, are provocative to the extent that they urge us to focus on some of the issues that are taking place. But ultimately, they're all about demanding things from either corporations or governments, right? How about instead reorienting the dynamics, right? What if instead of talking about bias, we look, for instance, at the history, at the culture, at the context, right, of all of those things that we've been talking about, to then be able to understand the oppression that has, given, that has been giving way to that bias. So if we do that, maybe we won't be so focused so much on the algorithms or the technical process through which this is taking place, but we will understand it in many ways at its core, right? Um, so again, Dr. Bird talked a lot about history, right? And, and this, for me, has been a very valuable lesson, right? Because when we look at these problems, a critical, critical message, I think, is it's always historicized, right? Frederick Jameson used to say, history is what hurts. And I think that that is crucial to consider when we look at some of these questions, right? We can talk about bias, transparency, and accountability, but we can also look underneath that, right? And try to dig at some of the bigger historical conceptual problems. So yes, let's talk about the social good. And yes, let's talk about social classes. But let's also talk about cooperation, right? So let's talk about different forms of ownership. Let's talk about platform comparativism, for example, right? Let's talk not about wiki washing, but about some of this crowdsourcing efforts that are actually taking place that allow for collaboration, right? Let's think about community networks, right? Such as, for instance, Rizomatica in Mexico. Let's talk about public interest. Let's talk about private interest, yes. But let's also talk about the commons. Let's think about coming up with governance, not necessarily from up top, but from below. Right? Let's think about community spaces. Right? Let's think about how we can build those environments that are conducive to the sharing of knowledge and to the sharing of practices. And at the same time, let's think about having the right legal frameworks precisely to encourage the sharing of concepts. As it refers to, equi to equality and equity, again, these are very critical concepts and very important that we have these conversations. But let's also think about compassion, right? Oftentimes, I find myself when talking about ethics, and particularly in some of these academic environments, we get lost in this conceptual discourse, right? Even, for instance, teaching ethics classes. Numerous sessions can go by when we're talking about ethics, and neither the students nor myself bring up the concept of compassion. How can we talk about ethics if we're not talking about compassion? And again, a lot of very important efforts are being made in that regard, from activists, for instance, who are looking at underrepresented populations, from research centers that are looking at instances of political violence, right? And also from activists that are looking not so much at issues of social justice, but also of environmental justice, right? and how important that is. So in my mind, it's that when we talk about some of these concepts, when we talk about the social, when we talk about the public, when we talk about DEI, yes, these are very important, right? And I am very adamant about the fact that we should continue to have these conversations. In my mind, I think it's very important that we also talk about what I call the care constellation, right? So this, in my mind, is fundamental to what it is that we're striving for when doing ethics. To talk about cooperation, to talk about commons, to talk about compassion, to talk about care. Right. Now for my second question. If we are interested in talking about care, right, and uh, if you've believed me thus far that this is an important part of what it is that we care about, well, it, it, it seems like you know, maybe in our classes um, or with students, maybe this wouldn't be something so hard to talk about, right? But again, something that maybe we've all encountered to some level is, well, as I mentioned, that yes, the students are concerned about getting good grades, are concerned about finding good jobs, ultimately having an impact on society. But as I said before, they are very stressed out, all right? And, and, and they're very concerned about the exams, they're very concerned about the grades, right? And as I said before, COVID has not made any of this better. 
So what is it that happens is that, well, at least in my experience, sometimes you try to talk about care, about cooperation, compassion, the commons, right? But students, again, under this level of stress, are, jo are just more focused with, well, is this going to be on the test, right? And, well, you know, what do I need to do to get a good grade here? Because I want to be able to go and work for this specific corporation. So when that happens, there's no sight of what comes after, right? There's no notion of the fact that, well, it's not just about getting a job. It's also about what you do at that job and what kind of impact that job will have in the world, right? So they lose sight of the fact that, well, the users are stressed out too, right? And that the users are also suffering from all of these historical and social inequalities that we've been talking about. Right? So a lot of the effort in my mind is, is trying to encourage the students um, and, and, and personally, again, as an ethics professor, coming up with ways that can push them to see beyond this kind of immediate goal. Right? In some way, to have that empathy and compassion for the users and to think ultimately about the social impact of the technologies that they're working on or that they're thinking about developing. So, as I mentioned before, there has been a lot of work in universities, um, and to be fair, this has gone on for a long time, perhaps even way before that tech ethics became, or recently became, an issue of public discourse. Um, uh, this excellent article by Casey Fiesler and her collaborators actually crowdsourced to see a lot of the work that is currently taking place in tech ethics, and what we found is that there's over 200 courses in over 10 countries around the world. As I mentioned before, there's a lot of efforts from conferences and then also a lot of literature, even some excellent documentaries that have come out lately that deal with some of these questions. Again, just bringing more and more some of these questions to the public mind. And here at Rice, we, we, we have been taking a step in that direction as well. Right? We have been putting a grain of salt in terms of working together towards some of these goals. Right? So we've been teaching undergraduate and graduate courses in computer ethics and data ethics and AI ethics. Um, in particular, I run an applied ethics PhD seminar that I'll talk about in a moment and outside of the classroom, right? Because I think it's also very important that we share best practices with collaborators and that through lectures and public appearances, we're also talking across disciplines and with other universities and well, of course, with our research, which I'll mention a little bit as well. So um, if, if I could conceptually frame the work that we've been doing here at Rice University, um, I call it deep tech ethics. And the, the reason for that is that in all of my work, I've been very inspired by deep ecology, by this environmental movement that is all about moving from kind of shallow approaches that are based on hierarchies and thinking about the extrinsic value of things and these kind of short-term perspectives, right? So again, as as applied to ecology, a kind of shallow approach is, well, how can we save the planet to continue to exploit it, right? A kind of deep approach is instead more holistic insofar as it's not dealing with human exceptionalism, but it deals with networks. It, thinks about the, it deals with things about their intrinsic value and also takes this long-term perspective. So what I try to do is to bring a similar view to the classes that I teach. So. Um, these are some of the topics that we talk about in our computer ethics course. And just to give you a couple of examples of how we talk about it. So we deal with the issues of algorithmic bias. Uh, this is a very famous case brought forth by ProPublica, which as they put it, there's software used across the country to predict future criminals and it's biased against blacks. So how do we talk about this in class? Well, a kind of shallow approach would be to say, well, you know, if there's something wrong with the data, well, we just need to think about how to analyze it differently or what models were that are used, right? Or maybe we just need to go and obtain more data. Or maybe we apply a technical strategy here to debias the data, right? Or if you want to take it further along the lines of policy and governance, let's think about more transparency, auditability, accountability. All of this, please don't get me wrong, all of this I think is very, very important work, right? And all of this is stuff that we talk about in class. But I also try to push it into a deeper perspective. Because, well, if, if we think about what is the history behind some of these racist algorithms, for instance, 
What we encountered is that, again, they were brought forth within a certain particular historical context, right? Dirty policing leads to dirty data, as researchers have put it, right? And then perhaps even thinking even more broadly than that, right? What is the history of the criminal justice system, right? What, what is it there for? To serve and protect, but to serve and protect who, right? And what better strategies can there be perhaps to think about some of these historical inequalities? Um, as we think about these topics, I, I also, I, I ask students to engage in what I call the ethics lab activities. So for instance, I, I have them formulate a social impact statement as if they were working for some of the corporations that are developing some of these algorithms that could easily fall within some of these discriminatory lines, right? And this is based upon existing research that is taking place. How can we make principles for accountable algorithms? And we see this in some of the public statements that are put forth by certain corporations. But I also, again, push them to think further, right? So for instance, I show them uh, Costanza Chalk's principles of design justice, right? which explicitly talk about how, well, from the developer perspective, it's, it's not just good enough to have good intentions. It's not just good enough to have neutral intentions, right? We need to think about the user first, right? We need to think about the communities that will be working with these technologies. And this, again, is a kind of paradigm shift because it's not saying, oh, well, wouldn't this be a cool technology and then seeing what the impact is on the users, but considering the users from the very start. When we talk about corporate surveillance, again, a lot of questions precisely around, well, social media use and that the business model is set up in such a way that users are sometimes unwitting, unwittingly giving some of, some of their data. A shallow approach would be to say, okay, well, you know, are the users consenting? It seems they are, you know, they're clicking okay, right? So this is a rational informed judgment, right? So, you know, some questions that you hear about is saying, well, you know, maybe we need to compensate users for their privacy, right? And how much should they be getting, for instance? A deeper approach is to say, well, what are some of the nudging mechanisms here at play, right? Some of the unconscious forces that are leading users to act in some way or other, right? People often talk about this as addiction. Is that the right frame, right? Addiction normally refers to a substance that you need to remove. Can we remove social media? Do we want to remove social media, right? Um, questions about instant gratification, right? Some of these is perfectly designed to work in certain ways. But what does that mean in regards to the user's ability to practice attention, right? To practice empathy. So again, I have students work on this activity, uh, which I call How to Do Nothing, after this excellent book by Jenny O'Dell, in which uh, she encourages students uh, to go and drop off their devices for a moment and engage in a leisurely stroll. Uh, she very much understands the privilege that is involved here in terms of taking a day off or a few hours off to go and take a stroll through the park. But ultimately, she encourages us to think about, well, how this opens up the opportunities precisely for empathy, right? So she, she has this, this quote in the book, which I, which I very much adore, in which she says that sometimes when we pay attention to things, we realize that what we thought was one thing actually becomes many, right? Uh, so, you know, sometimes I talk to students about this and, you know, I tell them, you know, what was the first time that you tasted beer? And they all say, ah, yuck, right? But then as you get to know it a little bit more, as you get to understand it a little bit more, the different flavors, the different tastes, et cetera, right? Um, then you see, well, yes, there is so much more to things if you, can be, if you can become attuned to them. And in my mind, this is an excellent strategy, right? Because if the students are stressed out, in many ways, it's because they have this linear vision of progress. It's because they think that every moment of every day must be spent in terms of working on themselves and in terms of attaining this goal, right? But there's so much more to life than that, right? Progress isn't necessarily the only objective, and it isn't necessarily a straight line. There's all of the work that we put into ourselves, into our daily maintenance, and that people put around us. So this is something that Odell brings up too. The beautiful garden isn't a beautiful garden as it isn't for the people that work and that tend to the garden. And how often do we pay attention to them? Um, in working with PhD students, 
Um, and in many ways, this is all thanks to the support of uh, Lydia Kavraki, who's here with us, and the amazing work that they do in her lab with computational robotics and AI, with computational biomedicine. Again, in the lab themselves, they do excellent work on motion planning and involving humans in the loop. They also do excellent work when it comes to healthcare and developing vaccines. And in our applied ethics seminar, what we have had is students that want to apply some of these ethical principles and values into the research. So in biomedicine, for instance, they're looking at some of the databases that are used for cancer research. All right, what are some of the genomes that are going into those databases and are those equitable? When it comes to computational robotics and AI, right? Historically, there's always concerns about automation, right? And how they will, machines will automate people out of jobs. But how can we think about this with further cultural specificity? Um, and just to end, because I know I only have a couple of minutes left, but I think it's very important the work that we do outside of the classroom, right? So um, when I started working here with Moshe, it was precisely my first time publishing pedagogical research. And it was very important for me to have a network that I could learn from and also share some of my research with. Um, Moshe and I have also been speaking to different universities, right, where we've been sharing some of what we've learned in terms of teaching technology and ethics. And we've also been learning from colleagues in other universities. Um, we've co-written a couple of publications, precisely outlining our approach when it comes to deep tech ethics, talking about computers and care, and there's many more to come as well. And ultimately, this is, this is what I want to end up with, because for, for me, this is a very important message that, you know, we, we think about the university, and I showed this picture before, which again kind of shows this heavily idealized version of what an academic institution would be. But if we focus in on the center of it, there's also this very interesting tension going on between Plato and Aristotle, right? Because they're talking about ethics, and, and Plato is pointing to the sky. Right? Because Plato is, is all about forms and ideas, right? and thinking about ethics in this kind of timeless and universal constructs. Aristotle, on the other hand, as you can see, is keeping it more grounded. Right? Aristotle is saying, no, ethics is more about the particulars. Ethics is more about this kind of practical wisdom. Right? And it's very curious to me because um, Aristotle is very well known for his quote about man being a political animal. Right? And sometimes people take that to mean that, I don't know, that, that every individual is, is in this political warfare or must be conniving or must be considering their political interests or something like that. But that's very far off from what Aristotle had in mind, right? Because as we can see clearly here, Aristotle is having this conversation not by himself, but precisely as a part of this community, right? And to me, this is ultimately the message in terms of what we're trying to do with tech ethics, right? Because, yes, man is a political animal, and as Aristotle said, one whose nature is to live with others. But I think we can slightly rephrase that to further emphasize the message that Aristotle had in mind, which is that man is a political nature, is a political animal, one whose nature is to care for others. Thank you. mention Socrates. Did he exist? So Socrates spoke uh -huh. against power. Uh -huh. And he paid the price. Yes. Right? Tenure in the United States was developed, I think it started at Stanford, mm -hmm. when a faculty member was fired because he spoke against the gold standard. And Ms. Ms. Leland, Mrs. Leland Stanford was not happy with that. And she got him fired. Yes. That's how tenure was installed. Yes. So the purpose of tenure is to protect faculty, faculty member and let them speak truth to power. Mm -hmm. I think we've become too timid. Mm -hmm. We're not speaking truth to power. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we have to say, you know, what happened? We have to look at ourselves in the mirror. Yeah. And says, how come the tenured faculty members very rarely speak truth to power? Yeah. Here we are in Houston, we had a session this morning about climate change, just a few miles from here is the, is the 
center of the of oil and gas industry. And you hear people that try to speak about it? No, they are very close. They have lots of money. We want some of that money. Yeah. We don't talk about that. Yeah. I mean, the whole, in fact, the sustainability movement that rise is very new. For years, nobody dared to go seriously, seriously there because of the power of the oil and gas industry. And here we are, with large endowment, but we want more money. Mm -hmm. So we became timid. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think that it's interesting to, so to think about Socrates in this regard, right? Because uh, Socrates, again, accused of corrupting the youth. And in the Apology, he, he ultimately accepts his fate, right? And, and the reason for doing that is saying that, well, I, I understood what the rules were to begin with. And again, in his mind, or at least the way that he phrases it, is that, well, I submit myself to these rules, right? Because ultimately, these rules are for the embetterment of society in the long term, right? I, you know, I think that these, those were very particular circumstances, right? And, and I wonder if under different circumstances, he or anybody else would have been so easy to acquiesce to that, right? And that brings up the question as to when do we speak up against unjust systems? Thank you, Rodrigo. That was mm -hmm. a really nice talk. So um, one thing, I know you probably don't want to do, but I'm mm -hmm. going to ask you to do it anyway. Okay. Is to uh, to give us, so, you know, I have young kids who are always on their tablets, and I mean, what can we do? Yeah. Like, I think I, I want to think about these. Is it, you know, I wrote down the name of that book about unplugging, et cetera, but what can we do? What can we tell our kids to kind of keep these uh, ideas in mind? Yes, 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 absolutely. And I, I have to tell you, Margaret, um, when I first started teaching a few years ago at NYU, I, I had a situation where um, it, it wasn't common at the time for students to have their phone out in class. There was one student that kept doing it. And uh, you know, I talked to her, and at first, very professorial. I was like, hey, it's on the syllabus that you can't have your phone out. right? So if I see it again, you know, I'm going to have to deduct some points. She kept doing it. Um, so eventually, I, I pulled her aside, and I said, look, you know, I've, I've, I've called this out several times. I could fail you, right? But I'm not interested in that, right? Just think about this differently. Like, I'm, I'm trying to talk to you. I'm trying to share something with you, right? And you're just not paying attention to it, right? And you might argue it's disrespectful. And for, for me, this was very insightful, right? Because I told her, imagine if you were at the dinner table, right? And imagine if you were trying to talk to your parents and they were on their phones and not paying any attention to you. How would you feel? And what she responded really struck me, right? Because she said, well, my father's on his phone the whole time, and he doesn't care. Right? And, and that's when I knew that we were fighting an uphill battle, right? Because, yeah, I mean, I teach ethics, but it's only a certain amount of time that I get with the students, right? And look, for... for you know, as much of an ideological critique that we could make of families, there's the fact that they remain the social nucleus in today's world, right? And a lot of these ethical practices, which maybe families don't see as, as ethical practices, take place there, right? So in my mind, um, and, and again, this is perhaps to go back to, to just the spirit of your question, right? How important it is to practice empathy to practice attention, to practice care. This is something that Aristotle and that others who talk about virtue ethics have, have really pointed to, right? That ethics is practical wisdom. And if you don't practice it, you lose it, right? So how important it is for us to practice paying attention to one another. You know, attention has been commodified. But in that regard, we can also fight back. It is also a very valuable resource if we think about it this way. So how can we cultivate it? And how can we orient it for the purposes that we want it to be oriented? Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, students being stressed out about exams in the newer yeah. generations. But uh, I think that's also part of a much broader uh, phenomena, which is 
it becoming more and more of fight for survival everyday survival for vast majority of the world's population and that fight for survival uh, essentially means that people care less and less about others and just more and more for their own well-being because yeah. you know like the basic needs like food clothing shelter uh, getting security in those aspects is very hard mm-hmm. um, and so like one view is that until you take care of these things thinking about ethics or any other like higher needs is going to be a losing battle because um like it's just a numbers game essentially and this kind of phenomena plays out on various aspects like not just education um like just traffic for instance like yeah. when you have traffic like i've seen in india for instance where it's just a gigantic pile of cars and you know all sorts of vehicles trying to get somewhere and the resources are just not capable enough to um, manage that kind of load Mm-hmm. then all sorts of ethics or traffic laws go out of the window and everybody is just fighting to get that one more inch um, yes 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 absolutely which is very different from traffic in houston for instance which is bad but still not as bad as that yeah no and i so, understand i i grew up in mexico city and i learned to drive in mexico city so i know right. what you're talking so about so what yeah. are your thoughts on like how do we approach this yes 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 so i think that that is an excellent question right and, and i couldn't agree more in that look I, i i didn't mean to be facetious in any which way talking about the students anxiety over the exams because there's in many cases a very real foundation for it right which is that you know the students are suffering at times for crippling student debt right or we don't know what their circumstances are at home where it is very important that they get the best grades to get the best job right so all of that is of course under consideration and very real problems here right but as you mentioned right what what is a kind of underlying problem that we see here right because yes you're right when you're living in a context where there's a scarcity of resources the name of the game is competition right when there's scarcity of resources you better get yours because if not somebody else is going to take it right and you know in in many ways that way of thinking has been completely normalized by society right there's there's the myth of the state of nature right the neoliberalism is kind of premised on a lot of those same values and ideas right but again that only applies in context of scarcity right when we think about you know the history of industrial production when we think about the abundance of resources that there theoretically could be available at the disposal of different people around the world right And again, we don't need to get into the nitty-gritty of it, right? But we could think about how there could be this slight shift from scarcity to abundance. And when you're in a situation of, of abundance, right, competition doesn't make sense, right? Because if you're competing and you're putting down others, you're going to be the outcast, right? In a situation of abundance, cooperation is what matters, right? When you're with people that have what they need, that's when they're not an enemy. They're not a threat. They're there with you to enrich your life. So for me that is the most significant paradigm shift, right? We need to first of all transform the situation from scarcity to abundance, but then let's not come up with these artificial scarcities and let's not come up with these political and economic systems that just keep reinforcing those scarcities because then there will be the change in mindset, right? It's it's not good for us to continue normalizing competition. Again, instead it's about cooperation. And that's why for me it is so important precisely to think about that. But I think I think that is yeah. Thank you. Guys.